Okay, folks, we're going to get started. I'm Dan Rundy. I'm, uh, I hold the Schreier Chair here at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. We're here to talk about redefining U.S. foreign assistance strategy for middle-income countries. I think it's a timely topic uh, given the, the context that we're in. Uh, we have a very interesting panel uh, that you have the biographies in front of you. I won't go through them, but just suffice to say that we have uh, some, uh, some friends and colleagues on, on this panel. We have Carol Peasley uh, from SEDPA and a former Senior Foreign Service Officer. We have Heather Conley, who had a distinguished career at the State Department and is also a colleague of mine here at CSIS and runs our Europe program. Also have Ivan Vevoda, who's the Executive Vice President at the German Marshall Fund, and prior to that, ran the Balkan Trust for Democracy for the German Marshall Fund, a, a pooled trust fund or a pooled fund that you'll hear about in a few minutes. And then we also have Steve Feldstein, uh, who's uh, on, the, on Capitol Hill uh, and the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. So I'm going to uh, change places. I'm going to sit down here at the, uh, at the table, and I'm going to hand the podium over to my colleagues. Thank you. Carol, I'm going to... Carol, I'm going to ask you to go first. Oh, okay. Yeah. We agreed we're going to sit. Yeah, we agreed we're going to sit. <laughs> okay. Because it's a friendly audience, so right. we're, we're going to sit. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Dan. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, as Dan mentioned, I had a, a very lengthy career with uh, USAID, and I saw the effort to graduate or to move into middle income strategies from various platforms. Uh, just an introductory remark, in 1977 I was the primary drafting officer for a strategy for USAID to phase out of Costa Rica by the end of uh, fiscal year 1980. We uh, identified a series of development and poverty indicators we expected to be met by that date uh, and recommended closure of the USAID mission if, when, those indicators were achieved. Uh, we also spoke about the need for sort of continued uh, long-term partnerships between the U.S. and Costa Rica. We expected the strategy to uh, provoke discussions in Washington, but we did not expect it to lead to the exact opposite of what we proposed. The result of our uh, recommendation was an expanded USAID program and mission uh, that grew uh, by leaps and bounds as a result of our recommendation to close it. Uh, so I still joke that I was responsible for one of the least effective documents in the history of USAID. So, uh, but it, it, it did get me thinking about some important issues. Then in the 1980s, I was in Thailand when we moved towards a middle income strategy uh, and we're focusing that USAID program on uh, the most marginalized of the poor and on a series of middle income issues, uh, environmental protection, uh, food safety, uh, private sector development. And then again in, in Russia in 1999 to 2003, again faced the issue of graduating an aid program or at least moving certain parts of it, phasing out certain parts of it to a changing, uh, uh, changing Russia. So, I've seen the question of, of foreign assistance in middle-income countries uh, several times, but Dan has really not asked me to talk about those experiences today, but to focus on my experience in the Africa Bureau in the early to mid-1990s when USAID decided to close some 20 USAID missions worldwide. I think eight to ten of those were in Africa, and they ranged from Botswana, which was an emerging middle-income country, to Chad and Niger, two of the uh, poorest countries in the world. I might add that Costa Rica was one of those identified in 1994, and I think it ultimately did close in 96 or so, so only 17 years after or 16 years after we had recommended it. The, 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 um, I think that just about anyone who had been involved in that process in the mid-1990s would say it was not well done and that lots of mistakes were made. Um, and I guess the, the one benefit of mistakes is that that helps to learn lessons for the future, so you do it better. And what I'd like to do is to just summarize a few of those. Uh, first, even though the momentum for closure of aid missions may start at the top of the agency, uh, and it could be the administrator or head of policy or management, the decisions need to be made on a consensual basis. 
and that starts within USAID itself. Uh, in 1994, it was an extremely centralized process, and uh, basically decisions were dictated, uh, and we in the Africa Bureau were simply presented a list of USAID missions for closure and dates by which the closures needed to be completed. There was no prior discussion, and we thus spent countless hours and huge amounts of energy arguing and negotiating changes. It just isn't a good way to go about making a, such an important decision. This leads directly to the second lesson. The decisions to close USAID missions must be carefully coordinated with the State Department. We in the Africa Bureau and back in 1994 were in fact instructed not to talk to the Africa Bureau and the State Department, and not to let them know in advance which uh, countries were involved. Needless to say, this created a lot of ill will, and all of us had to expend, again, extraordinary amounts of time and uh, energy uh, trying to recover relationships with state colleagues. And secrecy made it all more difficult. Uh, I think just part of this flipping it over to the other side is the need to plan graduations or closures over a multi-year period. A long-term strategy needs to be worked out in collaboration with the State Department and the host country, and in most cases, the relevant congressional committees. Programs need to be designed to end in a rational way. Otherwise, there's no hope of sustainability, and investments don't realize the gains that, that uh, were originally uh, justified those investments. Uh, and also there needs to be some thought about post-closure mechanisms. Precipitous closures lead to wasted program resources and to ruptured relationships with host countries. Another lesson is to be honest about the reasons for closures. Don't claim graduation when it's not the case. I still have nightmares about meetings uh, to close our USAID missions in Chad and Niger two of the poorest countries in the world. Some people in the center were trying to use the graduation word. Uh, if missions are being closed because countries are poor partners, figure out some way to say that in a palatable way. If they're being closed solely for financial reasons, uh, that should be said. Uh, and then, in fact, if that is the reason, maybe there are other alternatives to reduce costs besides closure. And perhaps most importantly, one needs to recognize that cost savings do not occur immediately. In fact, there are substantial costs in the short term to closing missions, especially when they are not planned, when it hasn't been planned over multi -year, uh, a multi-year period. Uh, and in fact, the decision is done on an accelerated basis. These costs include the early transfers of direct hire staff. They include severance pay for foreign service nationals the disposition of offices and equipment, the costs of terminating grants and contracts early, all the time of Washington staff and t other TDYers to help close out the books and projects. There are also incredible costs to develop closure uh, plans. There are countless details that need to be built into this process, including the analysis of local labor laws and negotiations with host country governments. Substantial time has to be devoted to preparing those closure plans and to gaining consensus on how to move forward. And there may well be cost savings over time, but it could be years before they are indeed felt. And, and some of those uh, savings even get eroded over time as uh, alternative programs and structures get built. I would simply point out that how many times the USAID mission in Panama, Tunisia, Morocco, Thailand, and Botswana have been opened, closed, and opened. And, and the costs are substantial if you don't really think it through carefully at the, at the outset. Um, uh, and that's really are some of the lessons that I certainly learned in 1994, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Th thanks, Carol. <clears throat> I uh, specifically asked Heather to be on this panel given her experience at the State Department and. Carol was talking about the need to coordinate closely with the State Department, and oftentimes uh, a lot of the resistance to closing a specific mission comes from the State Department because of concerns about damaging the bilateral relationship if it's done the, the wrong way. So I'll hand over the floor to you, Heather. 
Well, thank you so much, Dan, Carol, Yvonne, Steve. It's great to be uh, with such uh, great colleagues here. I, when Dan asked me to, to speak, I kept saying, are you sure you want me to speak to this uh, audience on this topic? Uh, so, uh, Carol, I think I will relate my stories, uh, <laughs> I think, uh, by way of uh, uh, introducing uh, this topic. And I, I just want to say one uh, note of self-interested ad advertisement. I, I think CSIS is really doing a huge amount of work uh, reconceptualizing conceptualizing development, how it intersects with diplomacy, and Dan's part of a, a great team that we're assembling here, so it's a pr privilege to be part of this uh, great uh, family in, in this space. I'm sort of the, the beginning and the end, that at least was my, uh, my two stints at the State Department. I began my career at the State Department in the coordinator's office that coordinated all U.S. government assistance to the former Soviet space. And um, this, of course, a State Department-led coordinated uh, office was controversial at the time. Uh, many of our AID colleagues were uh, not enthusiastic uh, about this construct. At the time, Deputy Secretary Larry Eagleburger uh, was very insistent, both for the Eastern Europe program, the SEED Act, and then eventually uh, Congress approved the Freedom Support Act, that the political sensitivities of this particular assistance program uh, demanded uh, a State Department-led effort. The coordination, I will tell you, uh, was extraordinary. Uh, 20 uh, U.S. government agencies from the Trade and Investment Agencies, Department of Agriculture, Health and Human Services. It was an extraordinary time as we were working towards the uh, Freedom Support Act, the congressional interest, the congressional focus. We were doing nuclear nonproliferation, uh, privatization, technical aid, humanitarian aid. It, it was sweeping. Um, and uh, it was something that, uh, quite frankly, uh, huge amount of focus and, and interaction. It's hard for me to imagine that next year will be the 20th anniversary of the Freedom Support Act. Of course, I was a child when I first started working on this project. Um, but uh, we, we're at this now for 20 years in, in different ways, uh, with some success and, and some lack of success. But it was a, a thrilling project to be a part of. When I returned to the State Department in 2001, I, I had the privilege of, of working in the European Bureau and overseeing Northern and Central Europe, and I was at the point of watching our Central European aid missions close. And I don't recall at the time, although I'm sure there was a lot of concern from USAID, uh, we were creating regional offices, the Budapest office was uh, focusing obviously on the Western Balkans, which was still a very uh, robust program. The, the, the complaints that I received uh, were from our ambassadors in the field. And, and the ambassadors were, were saying, listen, we're losing a vital tool to continue to develop our relationships with this country and most uh, particularly with civil society as a whole. The ambassadors didn't even have a small pot of funds to support very small seminars or reaching and helping develop a, a, a small uh, NGO that was trying to put on a, a seminar. And it was very frustrating to them. And what they then turned to was uh, public diplomacy dollars, Fulbrights and things focusing on those exchanges. But the pot was diminishing. And so I pulled an interagency group together to look at this. We understood the missions were closing, what resources were available to us, and I was arguing that if the United States did not remain visible and active and engaged in Central Europe, we were largely going to lose the policy benefits of a hugely successful 15-year assistance program. Um, here's what I was told. This region is a success. Your mission has been accomplished, and we're very focused on the Middle East Partnership Initiative, thank you very much, and that's where all our funds will be going. And while I conceded all three points, I felt it was extremely short-sighted. And so what I'd like to do is just sort of share my own thoughts of, of where I think we need a new paradigm here. And I'm not necessarily speaking about pure development per se. I'm talking about how the United States maintains, deepens, and strengthens its relationship within a country and regionally. The, the first rule is our work is never done. All democracies, in whatever phase they're in, are in a work in progress. Although democracies generally progress in the right direction, we have to acknowledge that they backslide. And I'm watching Central Europe and certain areas backslide right now. 
If the U.S. government has already made a profound investment in this country, why in the world are we walking away from it, whether we think it's done or whether we have other priorities and we're taking away funds and regional experts? We must continue to invest. We just have to be very creative and innovative and think about how we invest, invest anew. My frustration with the U.S. government leadership model in any particular country, it feels like we only have two speeds. Speed one, our way or get out of our way. Speed two, over to you, we're done here, we have more pressing obligations. This is my, our approach in the Western Balkans and I'll let Yvonne talk about that a little bit. We need to find the third speed, which means active U.S. engagement involve, and involvement in a country, in a region, but we're not necessarily leading it. We're partnering, and we may be partnering with the private sector. We may be partnering with civil society. We're not necessarily the leaders, but we're not leaving or seeding the field. As I mentioned, I'm really not talking about development. I'm talking about relationship management. And USAID, it, through its excellent development work, allows us to have a full and complete relationship with many countries. We get to talk to health ministers and agricultural ministers. We're out, ministers, we're out in the field. We're touching local society. And I, I tell you what, that's helping our reporting cables. That's helping us understand the complexities in a country. When that leaves, we can't touch and feel anymore. I'm, in full disclosure, I'm a strong believer in a more integrated development and diplomacy model. Not to influence or contaminate in any way our excellent development work, but to make it much more enduring, to make it more strategic. And so, as I see, the, the U.S. foreign policy leadership model needs to adjust itself to some new realities. Our influence is less, and we can't control everything anymore. But what this demands is that U.S. leadership through our embassies, through the interagency community, it demands a networked relationship model where the U.S. is engaged but perhaps is not the leader. In fact, maybe using its leverage and allowing others to lead. So this is a very different way we do things. We're a very centralized model and many times we don't allow our, the field and our embassies to lead us, to guide us in that. So I think we're talking about an, you know, an absolutely a new design. And in part that was what many of us were hoping that the QDDR did, was sort of reframe, redesign what American development diplomacy, and I would include public diplomacy in that, what that means in the 21st century. I think we're, we're making some tentative steps. I would argue with the events the last uh, three weeks in Egypt, it argues not for tentative steps, but for very bold steps in looking at this redesign of, uh, of U.S. leadership uh, around the world. Thanks, Heather. <clears throat> Yvonne, we've talked about, uh, we've heard about visible, active engagement, hold on to the gains, partnering, new realities, networked relationship model. This sounds like the Balkan Trust for Democracy. Uh, maybe you could tell, share a little bit about that and, and how that was, was created and, and who the partners are. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dan. It's a real pleasure to be here with uh, Carol, Heather, and Stephen on this panel. And I think the, the topic is absolutely not only timely but important, uh, not only given the events in the Mediterranean uh, area in Egypt, Tunisia, and other countries, uh, but also, as, as both uh, Carol and Heather were saying, you know, how does one maintain uh, the established levels of democracy, civil society, and avoid backsliding? Uh, the Balkan Trust for Democracy, which I had the honor of running for uh, seven and a half years until a few months ago, until I moved here to Washington, is, I think, exactly a type of new design, a type of new institution that uh, we are looking for altogether. And this was, I would say, a kind of a moment of leadership uh, at USAID, at the German Marshall Fund, uh, putting together uh, $10 million from each side along with uh, uh, the CS Mott Foundation from Flint, Michigan. So it was a, it was a private public uh, initiative uh, and investment to create a 10-year trust to support democracy in all of the Balkan countries, not only the Western Balkans. And I think it, it was, there was a lot of foresight there. there all the USAID missions were still uh, in office. Uh, but I think what uh, the initiative understood clearly, as uh, again Carol and Heather have said, that there's a, a dimension, a 
temporal dimension here that's very important. Democracy will not happen overnight. Uh, and secondly, even when we have the trappings of the beginnings of a cons consolidation of democracy, there will be need to support and sustain those actors who are doing the hard work of adv advocacy uh, watchdog activities. And in fact, if you talk to people in the region, whether it's offices that have been closed, like in Bulgaria, Romania, or Croatia, or in those that already exist, there's a fear that as European monies, which are of course the most significant ones in the region, come in, there won't be monies, f small monies, for those important watchdog and advocacy activities because a lot of the EU funds actually come through uh, governmental channels, even those going to civil society. And so the fear is that actually those voices will simply be shut off. And because there isn't sustainability of the civic sector in many of these countries, there won't be any monies for these people to apply for. And thus, there, there is true fear. I was just talking to a senior advisor to a prime minister of one of the countries who's also a think tanker uh, before he was uh, in office, and he said he would probably go back there when he was out of office, and that was exactly what he said. You know, there are American governmental and private funders who are leaving, and they are afraid that they will be left high and dry. So the Balkan Trust, I think, was a model and is a model. Uh, it has another two years of its 10 years to run. It's a sinking USAID endowment, but there will be monies left over from GMF and the Mott Foundation to carry on, and I hope we will do so. Uh, this model was then replicated in the Black Sea region uh, with the same people uh, and institutions involved, uh, the Black Sea Trust for Regional Cooperation, and a smaller version of it uh, devoted to Belarus, uh, the Fund for Belarus Democracy. Uh, what is interesting about these is that U.S. Uh, monies, whether governmental or private, leveraged European monies. Uh, the model uh, was deemed successful. Uh, by many accounts, uh, we received the uh, Global Development Alliance Award when Dan was uh, at USAID, and that's maybe why I'm here today. <laughs> um, uh, but more seriously, uh, we leveraged about uh, an additional quarter of the monies from governments, uh, governmental donors in Europe, and this was one of my goals as I took the leadership because this is a transatlantic initiative. So when we talk about new designs, innovative approaches, uh, we need to understand that there are other actors in the field. They may be uh, friendly actors, uh, they may be bigger actors, and you know this raises the, the uh, horribile dictu question of the coordination uh, between all of those in the field. But what I want to say and stress is that uh, we need to work with those others, if for no other reason than to understand what they're engaged in, how they're working, and whether there are gaps that we need to fill, like in the short story that I told you about, the, the think tanks and advocacy groups who are fearful that they will uh, be left without uh, any, uh, any resources to continue these activities. I think these are all pertinent lessons as we think of North Africa. Uh, at this moment, and there was even talk, as Dan will recall about four years ago, about creating a North Africa Trust along these same lines. We never got there, maybe this is the time to uh, rethink uh, that idea. Um, and I think when, when we're thinking about these uh, ways of acting, uh, we need to understand that there will be different types of action. So you will have the European Union, a huge donor, very kind of the juggernaut, cumbersome, you know, doing everything from infrastructure to governmental reforms to administrative reforms in health, education, and other things, uh, but also to civil society. And then the nimble uh, actors who have the quick, flexible approach, uh, such as some private donors, or in, in this case, the Balkan Trust for Democracy that was able to, uh, and is able to respond very quickly to turn around a project in two months' time, uh, to respond to a need that's coming from below. So listening to the local actors uh, is extremely important. Th th this is not donor-driven uh, in any sense of the word but uh, responds and uh, keeps its ears on the ground and is a very lean operation. There are eight people in that office in Belgrade who uh, disperse about three to four million dollars a year in small grants and small pots of money, I would agree, are extremely important. It doesn't matter how small they are. If there is an ambassador or a, an embassy that can give out for an event, uh, a seminar, 
you know, uh, uh, some kind of uh, advocacy, small advocacy. It's extremely important because it is a sign of trust, one, and secondly, that there is an understanding that these societies, these groups uh, need help. However developed uh, or middle income or even above mi middle income they may seem, and it has been alluded to, we have had backsliding in a number of European uh, new member states, uh, NATO and EU countries, and I think that is the lesson uh, that we must somehow digest in finding ways in which we can keep abreast of the need to be there uh, and to help sustain. And just one final concluding word, it needs a little more development, but there is a lot to do in helping develop local philanthropy. Uh, in these countries. Uh, again, the economic situation, even before the crisis, was not allowing for it, but there have been steps made in a number of these countries, and I think that there are ways in which aid and development um, uh, support can be targeted uh, to uh, helping uh, retrieve some old practices, because there was philanthropy in all of these countries in the 19th century, early, earlier 20th century, and then, of course, corporate giving, which I think is another important way in which uh, some of these retreats of funding can be supplemented for. Thank you, Ivan. I'll just make a couple uh, comments on, on that, and thank you uh, again. The, um, I was at the Brussels Forum last year, at the honor of being invited, and um, the presidents of Croatia and Serbia uh, were meeting, uh, it had just met pre prior to that meeting, and it was a direct result in my mind, for it was clear to me, because of the grant making and the support that had been going on cross-border between Croatia and Serbia, they knew each other, they were comfortable with each other, their advisors knew each other. And so it's these sorts of, <clears throat> these sorts of diplomatic gains that you want to see happen that were a direct result of several years of investment on the part of the Balkan Trust for Democracy. Um, you, there's this issue of local philanthropy needs to be supportive. I, I think this is one of the things that as if and when we have to close out a mission, this is one of the areas that needs to be thought about. As if, if, they're gonna, if, if USAID or the U.S. government is going to pick three or four areas, one of the areas on a sustained basis, the architecture of local giving. The Luso American Foundation was set up in the 1980s uh, with monies uh, used by, from the United States government to pay for the rent on the Azores Air Force Base in, in the country of Portugal. Actually, Frank Carlucci, who was then uh, ambassador in the 1970s in Portugal, negotiated the agreement. Um, he has an affiliation here with CSIS, uh, and uh, it has about 100 million at the time. This is, uh, there's sort of a, it's between 50 and 100 million euro endowment. It's uh, been in existence just 25 years. It has three areas of focus. It's on science and technology between the United States and, uh, and Portugal, uh, U.S.-Portuguese cultural uh, ties, and third is triangular cooperation between Portugal, the United States, and Lusophone Africa. Uh, it also happens to be based on this, this topic about uh, philanthropy. It's one of the large players in Europe the European philanthropy movement, was the founders of the European Foundation Center, which is sort of the Council on Foundations of, of the philanthropy movement in 1990 in, in Europe. So um, this, this issue of local philanthropy as, as an ongoing interest and, and is an imp one of the, if, if you can only pick two or three things to focus on, this would be one of the things in each country to leave behind. They're very, you have very sophisticated uh, and willing givers in countries like Brazil or Panama, uh, as, as Ivan's alluding to, there's a history of this in places like Serbia. So there, this is something to, to focus on in terms of as, as you think about what are some areas of focus. Well, my, I leave the last uh, uh, word to my friend Steve Feldstein, who's ha um, on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Uh, Steve, you've heard about austerity, but don't it, it, the austerity driving this, but don't do this too quickly. You've heard about investments in relationships, investments in development. Uh, you've heard of the, 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 about ongoing relationships, ongoing interests that we have in country, but also working with other partners. If we end up doing this, we can work with philanthropy, we can work with European donors, we can work with host country governments. What's the view from the Senate Foreign Relations Committee? Uh, well, well, thanks, Dan, and, and I'm also happy to be on this panel with Heather, Yvonne, and Carol. Uh, this is, uh, I think, a, a really apt and important topic and one that I think in some ways has sort of snuck up upon us uh, fairly recently, uh, both in terms of, you know, the changing budget climate that we're in, uh, a lot of discussions that are taking place uh, even today uh, on the House side and soon uh, on the Senate side. 
Uh, and also in light of recent, recent uh, announcements by USAID and Raj in particular, and even today, Mark Fierstein announcing uh, Panama and Guyana uh, in his hearing with Senator Menendez. Uh, so I, I think this is an, a very appropriate and important topic for us to, to consider. Um, one thing that Carol mentioned, which actually kind of uh, brought me back a, f uh, a few years, I, I had a chance to travel to Chad and Niger, and at that time when I when I went to both those countries, I wasn't aware uh, of the actual history to the mission closings, and so I remember landing uh, in Chad and and uh, talking to different uh, USG officials, government officials, and so on, saying, why don't we have an aid mission here? This is ridiculous. We have a burgeoning humanitarian crisis, uh, both you know, within Chad and outside uh, on the border in Sudan. Uh, huge you know, uh, sort of security governance issues all around. I mean, this, is, this is crazy. And then you know, having sort of talked further uh, and, and found out more of the history, you know, it makes you wonder uh, sometimes, do we too hastily uh, engage in this sort of uh, exercise, especially sort of in the name of cost cutting, which may or may not actually be something that ends up being the, the long term result. Same thing with in Niger. A year later, uh, I went out there as well, uh, and, and same sort of issues. There's, you know, certainly a strategic interest that has become more prominent. Um, I, I think uh, at, the t by at the time I was there, something like the third poorest uh, country uh, per capita GDP uh, in the world. Uh, so a huge developmental need. Um, uh, and, and, you know, again, sort of makes you makes one question uh, and, and pay a lot of scrutiny to, I think, the, the mission closing process. So, I mean, I, I would start with just a couple points. Uh, you know, first of all, as we're looking at the process today, um, you know, I, I would sort of issue uh, a word of caution uh, as we approach it. I think, first of all, um, there have been some announcements. I think some of the announcements have taken place really as a way to sort of preempt what are anticipated reductions uh, and a way to sort of you know, change the narrative of that conversation. Um, at the same time, there are a lot of lingering questions. First of all, we don't, I personally don't know, beyond three countries, I think, out of the seven that were announced to be closed, um, you know, I don't know what the other four even are. Uh, so I would assume, at least in, in the broader public, that's also unknown. Uh, that's, that's disturbing, and I think that's something that needs to be consulted uh, and dealt with in, uh, transparently sooner rather than later. Uh, even among the countries uh, that we do know, uh, we know very little at this point. Um, timelines, and Carol was talking about sort of a multi-year phasing out approach, uh, is something that uh, is not known. Um, you know, whether there, there will be some, some sort of legacy institutions uh, like Ivan uh, was speaking of, again, that's unclear. Uh, maybe certainly uh, more plausible in the case of Panama than Guyana. Um, some of the other programs, and we have a big PEPFAR uh, program, for example, in Guyana. Uh, and I want to speak a little more about Guyana in a second, but, you know, again, how that will be transitioned uh, is, a, is a, another big question mark. And so what we have at the moment are announcements without a real sense of, of either direction uh, or process. And I think, I don't think it's too late by any means. I think right now is, is the appropriate moment uh, for USAID, uh, the USG, other stakeholders to really to be in, to engage in these sorts of conversations. But I think that moment can pass too quickly and we'll lose the opportunity and then we'll have, I think, uh, you know, political issues uh, and bad will towards how this is going. So I, I would, you know, urge that this process happen uh, fairly soon. Uh, and then, you know, I think in, in general, as we think about what such a process would look like, um, I've had a chance to talk both to uh, other old, uh, you know, senior old USAID officials, um, uh, different uh, colleagues, uh, and I don't mean old, and I, I mean <laughs> experienced. I mean experienced. Um, it's only, only meant in a, in, in a, a positive uh, way. Um, 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 and and to, to consider what are some of the criteria that we should bear in mind uh, as we think through uh, the mission closing process. Uh, I mean, I think first of all, uh, the first question is, you know, why, why do we even consider this and, and cost savings uh, is a primary factor. You know, again, um, you know, what are the cost savings? Uh, what kind of cost benef benefit framework are we looking at and what kind of time period? You know, number two, uh, a consideration of the importance of the country to U.S. interests is something that we can't divorce uh, from, from these questions, despite the fact that some might consider a USAID mission to be much more on the, on the development side, I think with the sort of paradigm that we're looking at in terms of national security and development being a part of that, um, we have to think about what the national security imperatives are for the U.S. in a given country. Number three, the regional uh, uh, context, uh, thinking about what our regional interests are. And, and so, you know, if you look at the broader region, say WHA, 
uh, versus uh, NEA. You know, there are different uh, components that we need to be aware of uh, and different stability factors and other engagements that may be mutually supporting. Um, looking at the overall development level of the country and the trends, uh, and so, you know, that includes looking at IDA statistics, MCC indicators, the UN human development indicators, and really trying to get a, get a gauge on, on what we're considering with when it comes to the country, where, what its trajectory is, how much we've invested in it, uh, and where we realistically hope to see uh, the country go, at least as our engagement continues. Um, looking at what other donors are doing, uh, what we anticipate they'll do once we leave, what kind of gaps they will fill, but also bearing in mind that oftentimes other donors have followed the U.S. lead, and when we've pulled out, uh, it has, has oftentimes left a vacuum that other donors have not uh, uh, filled in. Uh, thinking in general about our development uh, objectives in a given uh, country, um, you know, when we anticipate those objectives will be, uh, will be achieved, uh, how much have we already invested, uh, will there be ongoing programs to administer, uh, and I think really at, at this point, including the USAID's new evaluation office in this uh, discussion is something that, that would be uh, important. Uh, obviously, timelines, as I've mentioned. Um, and then looking at post-closure options beyond that, and finally thinking about the uh, political dimensions. Um, and that not, that's not only, you know, sort of a uh, uh, Capitol Hill discussion, um, but, but it is something that, that I think we have to bear in mind in that, you know, there are places that tend to have more of a, uh, of a voice uh, and, and, and more of a constituency among certain members, and, and that can play out uh, in different things. Um, I, I think it's also interesting uh, in, in terms of the issue of who arbitrates and how these decisions, decisions are made within the USG to think a little bit about the state aid relationship. And, and I would think at this point right now that USAID uh, sort of unilaterally closing missions may not be as plausible or feasible as it once was. Uh, I would be surprised if this wasn't something that was fully done, at least in consultation and coordination. Uh, with state partners, uh, let alone uh, a broader array of actors, especially uh, on the Hill, but I could be wrong. Uh, and then I, I, I do think also it's, it's important to uh, think about the endowment and, and legacy issue. Uh, and I think, you know, different countries present different um, challenges. And so, you know, on the one hand, uh, if you look at sort of different legacy plans for Bulgaria, Croatia, and Romania, you, you have a certain set of issues. And I think uh, it's, there's a clear path to so how, sort of how that can be effectuated. Um, the, one of the endowments that has gotten a lot of attention uh, in the last few years uh, is Egypt. Uh, and I think that, f as a case in point, presents a whole different set of factors. Uh, I think, you know, for one, there's been a very lukewarm attitude on the Hill towards a potential endowment for Egypt, although it was something that was eventually included in appropriations uh, as recently as 2010 for the first time. Um, but, you know, there's, there's the, uh, the issue on the one hand of Egypt sort of making very clear that it would like to have an endowment with no conditions, uh, uh, no conditionalities. Uh, and on the other hand, I, I think at least sort of during the Mubarak era, uh, a lot of ambivalence about the governance, uh, human rights record, uh, and other dem democracy factors, uh, and whether having an endowment that we would put in an equal amount together with the Egyptian government but essentially allow a much greater degree of control by that government is something that's in the best interests of the United States uh, or our human rights community or the democracy uh, community in general. So that's, you know, again, I think there's a different, uh, there's a different conversation depending on the context. Um, finally, I wanted just to, to talk a little bit about Guyana in particular. Since, you know, we only have a few countries right now to think about, uh, and since, you know, I, I found it interesting that the, the topic of this, uh, of this, uh, uh, get together is, is sort of middle income countries. Well, Guyana, I think, is an interesting one to consider, especially because it's one of the first ones named. Guyana is not a middle income country. Its per capita GDP is uh, 1,420 uh, in the latest uh, statistics I saw. Um, if you look at USAID's description of its program in Guyana, it describes a place that faces many, quote, development challenges, vulnerable economy, rising crime, poor security, continued outmigration, HIV, AIDS prevalence rate of 2.5 percent, human trafficking and a political climate that threatens the country's ability to consolidate democratic governance. Well, it doesn't sound to me that, that this, on the face of it, is the type of sort of graduated middle-income country that we're otherwise talking about, whether it's the Baltics or something else. And yet, here we are uh, at a point uh, facing sort of the imminent closure uh, of, of that country. Uh, we also know that there are ongoing large programs that have taken place. The MCC Threshold Program funded at $6.7 million uh, and focused on the fiscal policy indicator. Um, also, you know, looking at obviously at the PEPFAR programs as well. 
Uh, and so when looking at that, you know, one, one would hope, first of all, that there's a, a longer multi-year timeline in place. Um, you know, certainly I don't know the cost savings that would come from placing these programs in a regional, uh, a regional context, but, but I would assume it's something uh, uh, that will still continue to bring a fairly amount of, uh, a large amount of costs. Uh, the truth of the matter is for the region that uh, assistance dollars have been declining and, are, uh, and most likely will continue to decline uh, for the foreseeable future. And so that in some ways plays into, into the decision, well, you know, do we continue a, a large program in a country that is smaller than some of the others, that isn't as, as of, of large strategic import as a Colombia, uh, as a, even a, a, a Brazil, uh, as an El Salvador, uh, for example. Um, and, and so, and then finally you look at the political dimensions. Uh, you know, unfortunately there isn't a huge, uh, uh, constituency on the Hill or a huge community in general that, that is able to advocate for it. So, you know, there you have, I think, in a nutshell, a lot of the issues that we need to carefully grapple with uh, and think about, uh, both in a country like Guyana, but more broadly on this issue. I mean, my last sort of point on, on, on the broader issue is that I think we do, uh, at least from the committee standpoint, need to consider and, and, and think about this in a very careful way, uh, that it, not, it is not something at all that I think uh, those who, who really sort of focus on the substance issues uh, on the committee are completely comfortable with uh, in, in terms of saying this is a foregone conclusion, that I think we need to work out the details uh, in the process transparently and understand what the answers are to many of these lingering key questions that are come about uh, when, when thinking about the implications of closing missions. Thanks. Thanks, Steve. Uh, one of the topics that's that hasn't been touched on. I just wanted to ask the the panelists if they could if they'd be interested in touching on the topic is is uh, use of various approaches or instruments towards leaving a country. There have been endow there are discussions about what are called endowments. Uh, there's discussions of there's been some mention of sinking funds. Uh, there are also oftentimes existing institutions that have been set up bilateral institutions oftentimes that already exist. Um, there's also been some discussion about set, putting in at development attaches on the ground in a number of number of uh, countries where they don't necessarily need resources so much as advice in some in some contexts and not all. Um, and then there's also been the discussion about how do we support countries as they develop their own foreign assistance plan. Uh, AID just signed an agreement with ABC, which is the Brazilian aid agency. Brazil has a thirty million dollar a year foreign assistance program, primarily in Lusophone Africa. Uh, and uh, AID is partnering with them. I suspect the reason AID and ABC are working together is because of the strength of AID's Foreign Service Nationals. Many of the Foreign Service Nationals from Brazil uh, who've worked with AID for a long time and understand AID have oftentimes migrated over and worked in countries like Angola and Mozambique and are able to do the crossover and, and understand both Brazil, the United States, and, and the local country. I, my strong suspicion is there are a handful of FSNs um, who've been involved in put, piecing those together is my, my suspicion. So various instruments, various approaches. May, I just would open up, the, I'd ask that one question of the panel, then I'll open it up to the broader audience. If some people could talk about instruments that they've seen or uh, that they that they think have worked or pieces of pieces of that in, in various countries and from a success standpoint. Okay. Spot. Okay. Well, I mean, I think Dan, all of the instruments you mentioned are are very important ones, and it just goes back again to the point, and I I thought Steve said it very well. You need to to do all of this very carefully and to plan over uh, a multi-year period to move towards. Uh, exiting and then thinking about what it is that you're leaving. I think endowments are a wonderful instrument and I think they are relatively inexpensive actually uh, and yet they have very little political support and uh, I battled many, many times in aid to try to justify endowments and, and we were not able to go forward with them. So I think that is something very, very important. I would add one other thing, and again, I think it's an example of when you really position a program for exit or graduation or exit, you can think about what kinds of partnerships you want to help to create as part of that exit. And I think one, and one that I've seen many, many places, it's when aid in the past did a lot to support um, 
the development of universities in developing countries, often the, there were technical assistance arrangements and partnerships developed with equivalent U.S. Uh, higher education institutions, and those partnerships continue today, 20 and 30 years after USAID put money into those contracts. So I think if it's part of an exit, you help to develop those kinds of relationships, you leave something that is very valuable behind. And, and just lastly, because I think in Russia, the steps that the aid mission there has taken to, to work really over the past uh, 10 years, increasingly to work directly with Russian civil society organizations and to help strengthen them, help to position them for private funding, and um, and also in the process maintaining their links to some of their U.S. parents. And I would give one absolutely fantastic example of the Urban Institute that went into Russia in the early 1990s to provide technical assistance on housing policy and housing reform issues. They realized the quality of the Russian staff that they had recruited to work with them they decided to have a secondary purpose of that project became to create the Institute of Urban Economics, a Russian NGO that operates very similar to the Urban Institute. It is now a very strong Russian NGO that is providing technical assistance throughout the former Soviet Union on World Bank loans and all kinds of things, and it has maintained its close professional working relationship with the Urban Institute, and those are exactly the kinds of relationships you want to see as aid exits a country. Really, in the Central European context, and speaking of the endowment, the Polish American Freedom Foundation, uh, the Hungarian American Scholarship Fund, again, these are these are great legacy uh, tools and really focusing on civil society and getting to that next generation. And, and quite frankly, that when I talk about building an enduring relationship with a partner country, it's really about next generational issues. And, and, and that's really, I have to tell you, when the exchanges go away, when that deepening and strengthening goes away, we really lose uh, the next generation of leadership. Uh, if I can just, if I may, uh, I thought a couple of Steve's comments were, were so important. As he was talking about, you know, really framing, I think, a fantastic approach to how you, how, how the government U.S. government thinks about uh, ending an aid mission. I was thinking, you know, we're so we're, we're so focused on advocating a whole of government approach to the development agenda. It's it's a whole of government decision making process when it comes to these types of issues. No longer can one agency simply own this. The uh, the prerogatives are too great. So, Steve, I I love that. And your question about what are other donors doing and donors following. U.S. leadership. I've been focusing a lot of my attention on the European economic crisis and what it is doing to uh, member, Eurozone members and, and the wider EU on their development agenda. And we're seeing very different things right now. On the one hand, the U.K. has ring-fenced DFID, but they are changing their approach and strategies in some respects. And what we're seeing in the European context is a much widening and broadening of the definition of what development is. It's much more in the national security rubric. They want that Afghanistan security and development counted. Uh, in fact, the Netherlands have been uh, uh, strongly advocating that the OECD be much more expansive on its definition of what the, their development assistance. They're trying to you know, readjust a lot of figures that they're not going to be able to meet MDG commitments that they've not, they're not going to be able to meet by a 2015 time measure. So we are seeing lots of dynamism in the donor community, quite frankly, as the dynamism is occurring right now as we're watching it in Washington. This is something we really have to monitor because it's not just what the U.S. is doing, it's what others are doing, and we could just see a, a real collision here of, of donors exiting and really having some unforeseen consequences. So, Steve, thank you for raising that. I thought it was a great point. Yvonne, you've seen a number of different instruments uh, at the German Marshall Fund. Some thoughts about approaches? Well, just to give you uh, a little more detail about the Bulgaria Fund, I think that was a, a case in point, uh, as Steve mentioned, when uh, USAID was closing down Bulgaria, Romania, and Croatia, the uh, leadership of USAID Bulgaria realized that they were leaving an unsustainable civil society and that there was a dire need to continue a lot of the projects in which there was 15 years of USAID investment and that if they simply cut 
uh, and left, uh, a lot of these uh, projects would simply go nowhere. So they decided to put aside two and a half million dollars as they were leaving. They shopped around to see who could uh, do the disbursement of these funds. And uh, to make a long story short, they came to the Balkan Trust. And so we, for three years, uh, worked uh, fully defined uh, framework given by USAID on uh, supporting both those projects that they had established or helped fund and then left us leverage to uh, look uh, for ourselves. And I think uh, we uh, did accomplish uh, a mission. It, this is just closed down. We finished the final year of monitoring. And what we saw with a very detailed analysis of the impact of uh, how many people uh, were touched by these projects, the, the additional funds that were leveraged, that it, it was a true success. And hopefully this is one uh, instrument that could be used in other uh, countries where USAID will, be, uh, uh, will, will not be there. And I think another one is um, as, as uh, missions are closed, uh, again, with those actors who have been supported not only by USAID but other uh, uh, other donors uh, have a huge repository of knowledge and experience. And these can be used in third countries. And we have seen some of that uh, leveraged, uh, you know, speaking for Serbia, a number of, uh, whether it was the youth groups uh, that were fighting against Milosevic who were then active in Georgia and Ukraine, they're actually in Egypt uh, today, who used uh, kind of, this was the early period of using the internet technologies, all this stuff, this was, uh, we're talking about the, the kind of late 90s where radio, internet were an extremely important tool to fight the authoritarian regime of Milosevic. So uh, another uh, would be uh, an, an NGO that has, I think, reached the heights of, uh, of uh, the best possible practices in election monitoring, in vote counting, uh, CESID from Serbia that also has been used by a variety of U.S. agencies. They've gone from Zimbabwe to Russia. Uh, these, are, these are kind of the, the highest level uh, civic institutions, and I think there are in other countries. These are, these are two very good examples that have survived and that have uh, been working for, for the better good of democracy in the region, but also globally. And I think there are ways in which other uh, such institutions can be used uh, as we move forward. I would like to simply second the idea of, of the university and the academic context. I mean, if, if you're looking at a, a long-term uh, support in developing the leadership of new generations, uh, I think this is a terrific tool. I know the example of the American University in Bulgaria. Uh, which is which is a terrific one. It draws not only people from the region, uh, it draws many more students from Central Asia who see this as a stepping stone. And uh, it, it is a terrific cross-fertilization of all sorts. It's cultural, not only academic. And, uh, you know, the, the, the monies that were invested of this have repaid many, many times over. Thanks, Ivan. Yes. The one thing I, I would say again, and, and sort of looking at the political currents and, and what support there is or is not uh, for endowments and other sorts of things, I mean, I think we have to just be very aware of the country context and that we should consider other alternate models beyond just a, a simply a bilateral government to government sort of endowment. I think when we do that, whether it's the university model that's been discussed or, or other sorts of uh, third party uh, civil society type of uh, funds or uh, foundations, I think that can be a, a very positive step forward uh, in the sense that you're not linking yourself specifically to a particular government, especially one that could change uh, depending upon how the politics evolve, uh, but that you are uh, instead sort of thinking and, and considering your engagement more in a broader way uh, and more in a broader partnership uh, uh, with the population. So I think, you know, if, if it's framed in that manner, I think there can and, and should be uh, much more political support uh, on the Hill for these types of things. Uh, and I think that's slightly separated from the endowment uh, discussion uh, that we've otherwise had. Thanks, Steve. I'm going to open the floor now to, to, to uh, questions. I'd ask that if when people ask the question, they identify themselves and also frame their statement in the form of a short question. <laughs> Tom, the, there's, some, there's a gentleman up here in the front row. <clears throat> Thank you very much. My name is uh, Tarek Ben Youssef. I'm from the Embassy of Tunisia. Mm -hmm. And uh, Tunisia <laughs> is a middle income country. And uh, as you know, it's uh, 
been inspiring uh, the whole region. I would like to seek you, uh, your, your reflection on what kind of assistance, uh, what kind of approaches the United States and the international community has to bring to Tunisian, which is seeking the international aid, as we all know, and which is in a democratic transition process. And we all know the importance of this democratic transition process, not only for the Tunisian, but also for the international community, for the European Union, for the international, uh, for the, for the international community in, in general, which could serve as a model. Uh, no one can deny that, because the Tunisian society has all the ingredients for the success of this democratic transition. So I would like to seek your, your perspective on what kind of approaches, what kind of assistance, what kind of measure the, the international community in general and the United States and the development community can, can bring. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll, I'll take a crack at that, and then I'm hoping the other panelists might make some comments. I, uh, one of my frustrations when I was in public service was I had hoped to set up a similar trust to the Balkan Trust for Democracy in the North, North Africa. Um, uh, I was willing and I and identified resources, but it was, uh, there was uh, some, some various hoops. So that's, that's one of those uh, what might have been moments. But I think obviously Tunisia is a country that AID quote unquote graduated you know, many years ago from a number of, because of the macroeconomic indicators, et cetera. Um, my, I think in the short run, it's probably going to be very difficult to set up an aid mission in six months time or nine months time is my guess. But I think there are a number of vehicles that could be looked at quickly. There's ongoing, the MEPI instrument is one that one could quickly move some resources into. There are a variety of democracy and governance uh, organizations that are federal, supported by the U.S. governments. There could be a big chunk of money that could go to NED and the NED affiliated groups. Um, and those would be quick ways to get something going. Um, it's, it's hard to imagine having a full on, my personal view is it's hard to having, imagine having a full on aid mission in, uh, in Tunisia, but who knows. Uh, but it seems to me that you could, there are a number of other vehicles in which that could be engaged quickly and should be engaged quickly. There is a regional platform out of Cairo as well, and there, I suspect this is going to be a regional <laughs> program as opposed to a individual bilateral program. So I'll stop there. Maybe my colleagues have other views. Yeah, you know this well. Uh, yeah, I really don't know. Other than to say that, I mean, this is clearly an issue that regional bureaus deal with all of the time in the Africa Bureau, you know, with missions in a small, relatively small number of countries, and yet dealing with an entire continent. There are regional platforms and regional programs, and I do think that, generally speaking, there is flexibility within those programs to respond to evolving needs. And uh, so I think that's probably the best bet is to be, to be talking to the uh, people who manage the regional programs, whether it's MEPI or regional uh, programs uh, within USAID. Other comments from others on this? Yeah. I would just ring in on, on the, the coordination element. We've talked about it up here, and this is where it, it's absolutely essential uh, for U.S., Europeans, others who are contributing to, to coordinate themselves and, and focus. I mean, my, my own experience with, with Central Europe, and it's a very you know, transformational um, element. Um, you know, you see lots of wish lists, they get circulated, people start moving on them, there's sort of confusion to it, but as much as there can be a convening and really focusing, much, much of it may be truly technical assistance that, you know, needing to rethink in the ministries uh, and, and you're really recalibrating. What we saw in Central Europe, we just had, uh, you know, for, for decades, uh, senior officials did not have an ability to think through these challenges it's not sort of your traditional assistance, it's having someone sit through, sit with you and think through the options and the challenges. And you know, if the Europeans are doing this and we're doing that, and it, it, it gets very confusing. So coordination, focusing um, uh, is, is so critical, and I agree for the speed at which using already existing instruments can help speed the process along. And best of, best of luck and best wishes. Yeah, just to add my two cents to this, um, I think that given the fact that uh, Tunisia is a country where there are so many people educated in the Western system, France obviously, but other countries, 
uh, in Europe, there's obviously a repository of knowledge in the civil service, in, you know, in the public administration. And so it's a question a bit like Heather was saying, you know, how do you help those people who know individually uh, to group and to collectively start uh, the, the reform process? Uh, I think that the idea of giving NED monies and then, again, using some groups from Eastern Europe who have gone through transition, whether on economic issues, governance issues, and I would add anti-corruption. I think that's, that's a key tool that's obviously been one of the grievances in all of these events, and a lot of work has been done, <clears throat> not to say that, you know, that there have been uh, magical solutions, but at least there are mechanisms uh, and various uh, types of transparency, uh, mechanisms that can be put in place and then simply being there and supporting those who are actually pushing this and of course there will be a lot of inertia you know it's hard to change uh, state institutions let alone reform universities and things like that but I think if, if one starts early enough and there's a demonstration of the willingness to support and to be there for the longer term I think then there's a possibility that one actually gets to where one wants to go yeah, I would say just uh, you know, in general, I think uh, there's sort of a, a dual track approach that might be worth considering. I mean, I think certainly there are some shorter term issues uh, with regard to sort of immediate, you know, transition issues with political parties and so on that probably uh, deserve uh, attention sooner rather than later. Uh, I know just as a parallel, for example, uh, that the administration has uh, prepared, is preparing, has prepared a package for Egypt. Uh, that's fairly significant that uh, has been notified to the Hill, and I expect similarly uh, the same sort of thing to happen uh, uh, with regard to the region. Uh, but I think I do think that we have to to be sort of um, prudent about the longer term institutional needs. Uh, there's uh, again a huge depth already uh, within Tunisia, uh, and and I think complementing that, you know, figuring out uh, you know from uh, the Tunisian side. You know where, where, what are our priorities? Where are deficiencies that we identify? Where could we use technical assistance and so on? And then coming together in that form and figuring out how that looks is is probably worthwhile to do in a more longer term uh, framework. Yeah. Just uh, we were just having a discussion about the uh, that this is the this, there may be an opportunity here similar to the when the Soviet Union fell that to engage volunteer organizations as well so there may be opportunities for for some of that as well uh, other questions other comments um, yes please um, Abby I'm a, I work at USAID in the Europe and Eurasia Bureau so we talked a lot about relationships and um, you're all nodding um, relationships and influence and a lot of intangibles and how do you square that circle with this at least perceived focus or need to focus on delivering results, having numbers, how many toilets were distributed in Haiti, that sort of thing. It's like when I, when I read reports about we provided technical assistance and the government was able to draft policy that enabled them to get an IMF loan, it doesn't seem that that really moves members of Congress, or at least we're told it doesn't. So how do we how do we make this happen if it just seems to us or we're told that we won't get support from the, the money purse? Carol, what, you want to? topic. Carol, yeah, no, yeah, yeah. no, no, no. <laughs> it, it, it's very <laughs> ironic because we had a brief conference call on Tuesday and, and actually we raised this question among ourselves and, and we didn't have any answers. But we, but other than to say that it is a dilemma and that, that in a sense it, to my mind, it, 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 it separates out development. And I think that, Heather, when we talked on the phone, you used, there, there's, there's, there are resources used to build, to engage and to build relationships, and there are resources you, to be used to achieve specific developmental results. And people need to be able to dif differentiate the purpose of the resource. And, and uh, I think it's a long slog to try to get there, but I think we have to. Just uh, uh, my sense is on democracy and governance or civil society development, those are particularly difficult or challenging sectors to measure impact. Uh, I, may, I may, actually, may ask Yvonne, I'm sure you were put on the spot many times on this topic around how do you measure democracy and governance or civil society achievements in, a, in something like the Balkan Trust for Democracy. I'm sure this, this came up often. I was afraid you'd ask that. <laughs> 
Yes, we, we've basically been grappling since day one uh, on uh, finding measures uh, on how the monies that are used uh, impact. And uh, as Dan said, I can only repeat, I mean, these are things that are very difficult to measure. I, I would say that in, in the case of Central and Eastern Europe and Balkan countries, there was an e easy measure, if I can put it that way, it was how these countries were advancing towards EU and NATO membership. I mean, that was a, a huge benchmark, you know, the, the, the benchmarks of both NATO and the European Union. Uh, were such that I simply said, you know, if we see that uh, after every year that we've done our work, these countries have made two or three or four steps, that means we're built in there somewhere with our very humble resources as, as opposed to others. And I think that's, you know, it's not flippant to say that. I think that there's a, a very serious element, which of course didn't preclude the fact that we had to do our measuring and that we actually then found out um, in a number of ways, for example, doing advocacy projects, you know, how much of that advocacy actually trickled into legislation in a variety of parliaments, in the creation of institutions, for example, the creation of a, of a civil society office in, in parliaments in the region or civil society offices in governments. Or, for example, when we did uh, reconciliation projects in, in the Balkan region where the war had uh, occurred in, in the 90s, uh, you know, how many times did these people meet, what came out of those meetings, what was there a follow-up uh, beyond the project, and we all, often saw that in fact uh, that an engaged project did leave those results and that there were networks that had been established where there uh, were none prior uh, to that situation. And then also the, the even softer projects, you know, dialogues between Albanians and Serbs, for example. Just the mere fact of having them meet was already a success, uh, let alone the substance of the discussion, especially among young people realizing that they were up against the same challenges, you know, unemployment, uh, having a diploma uh, that's worthless because the job market is such. Uh, wanting to leave, but you know, not being able to because there there weren't visas at the time, etc. So, I think that you know you you can measure it. I would say that the danger is if one only is devoted to that, and then one loses actually the energy to do the real work, which is going out there, meeting these people, and uh, actually working with them in the field. If I can just jump in, I, you know, in my own view, there is just an excessiveness of of audit evaluation, metric, metric, metric. Yeah. Uh, and while I'm a huge proponent of, you know, return on investment and let's not keep running down a road that's not producing results, this is my, my sort of my, my, my call for an absolutely new way of thinking about this because we've so now, I mean, I, I think that the, the auditing requirements right now are just so daunting. Uh, in, in, a, in a way, we're, we're sort of auditing for our audits for a purpose. So I think the pendulum needs to come back a little bit, sort of a return to common sense. But we, as Carol was saying, I, I think the only way you do it is you, you have to separate out. And what we're doing is we're building relationships, not for the metrics of the, the fiscal year, but we're building 20, 30-year relationships. So the young colonel uh, or the, the young lieutenant who will be in the next 20 years the head of the armed forces, the, the young university student who will someday become the foreign minister or lead civil society and things like that, that's what we have, that's the investment in the relationship and in the country. And we're moving away from that, and I think it's showing, I think our, our contacts are, 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 are limited, or becoming more limited. It's a very different process, and we've relied on the development agenda to sort of make up for that lack of deep engagement that we once had, um, and I think we need to return that. But it's bringing better balance, and I say that looking at Steve knowing very much that the Congress should demand uh, a return on investment of, of taxpayers' funds, but I think we need to have a more balanced, more long-term national security perspective by counting how many cell phones are in Afghanistan, right? It gives us one sense of some progress, perhaps, but it can't be what we're relying on for our own long-term engagement with a country. No, thanks. I, I don't disagree at all with, with what I've heard. And, you know, I think in general there's a misconception that uh, Congress is sort of wants to see more and more of these sort of output-based metrics and indicators as a way of, of knowing that its programs work. Frankly, you know, I don't think knowing that we built X amount of schools in Pakistan last year really tells us much of anything. It doesn't tell us whether there were actually people in those schools, whether they were taught, what they were taught, 
uh, and so on. I, I think it's a very misleading thing. It actually gives us a false sense of security in terms of uh, thinking that our, our uh, taxpayer dollars have impact when, in fact, it tells you little to nothing about the development impact. So I would say, first of all, you know, in some ways, the bureaucracy tends to perpetuate itself. And I think Andrew Natsios has an interesting paper out about that uh, from CGD. I advise you all to take a, take a look at it. But, you know, um, someone reacts 20 years ago in Congress for uh, is maybe someone misinterpreted, and all of a sudden you have an edifice that's built up. What I would say uh, is that, yes, I think the pendulum has swung too far in terms of uh, measuring every single output. On the other hand, I, I think there is a need to at least understand what the broader impact is, even if we do look upon it in a longer term lens, fine. You know, even if we, do, if we understand that uh, a relationship or an exchange that's built won't give you uh, an output right away. You know, I, I think at the same time, you know, there is. A, a need to sort of tie it causally to some broader objective. And if we can sort of go down that pathway uh, and have a, a, a renewed conversation on that, I think that's certainly worthwhile to do. I think we should put all this uh, on the table. And this is part of the foreign aid reform agenda in general, you know, the notion that we need to tie, uh, free up our development uh, professionals to, to, do, to do the work that, that's necessary and have oversight and make sure that, that they're conforming to broader priorities, but not tie them down so that it's only about responding to reports. Uh, the woman in the middle row there. Good afternoon. Caroline Brearley, also from USAID. My question, I, I like a lot of the things that I've heard. You've made very good points about don't just pull the plug right away. Think about legacy. Think about the broader national security questions. And yet, if I were sitting where the administrator sits at this particular moment, um, I don't think I'd be really comforted by a lot of what I've heard this afternoon. It doesn't, it's on a completely different um, plane from being pushed by OMB to phase out the appropriation for E&E by 2013. Um, the Republican study group saying, let's just ax AID's OE account completely. Um, if you were sitting where he is sitting. What would you, and bearing in mind your experiences, what would you do? Um, <laughs> I'll take a crack at that. I, and or one of the Mr. reasons, Administrator. Mr. Administrator, <laughs> right? My, my my sense is is that uh, I think my thinking in putting this together was to come up with a thoughtful a thoughtful response to what's going on out there. That there's a lot of forces going on there. I actually think that the tempo of what I think it's going to be a faster tempo than we would like and so I think this is in the ideal I think what I think it's but I do think many of the things that what I've heard today are the sort of the things that a lot of this is still operationalized are things that can be that can be done I think it's going to be there's going to be more than I suspect it may end up being more than seven and I think it may suspect it may be faster but it seems to me, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. To the extent you can do it, to, you know, to the extent that it requires a, an accelerated pace, I'm not saying that's the ideal situation, what are some of the things you can do to, sal don't, to, to, say, to hold on to some of these relationships? And how do you do it in a way that brings in other partners and does it in a way that doesn't hurt the bilateral relationship? So um, that would be my, my, this would, this would be my, my, my quick answer to that question. We can have a discussion offline if you want to. You know, I think what, what Steve began his remarks in talking about uh, the need to communicate and the need to have have some thought, a well laid out thought process around what your intentions are. I, I think for me, and uh, we held an event uh, a year and a half ago as the QDDR was was starting, and Steve came to a lunch, and I remember, and, and the Hill and AID at that moment, this was before Dr. Shaw's arrival, were not really communicating. They weren't even talking. In fact, we sat them around the table. It was the first time they were even communicating about some of the basics of it. So in part, I would, uh, other than uh, sending my thoughts and prayers, because this has got to be a, an incredibly challenging moment between Haiti, what's going on in, uh, you know, in, in the Middle East, and, and now a sort of budget assault. Oy. Uh, but it, it's really over-communicate with Congress, because now is the time. There are national security imperatives. And have a well-thought-out plan. 
to say this is my rationale. You can disagree with the rationale. You can tell me there's three other things that you think are more important, but we can have a, a discussion about that. I, I think, too, sort of the, the trigger of, oh, my gosh, we got to get out in front of this. We have to, it, it's, it's, it's Secretary Gates. It's let's do preemptive cuts so maybe they won't cut us more. Mm -hmm. So AID tried to pull a Secretary Gates in, in some respects, it sounds to me, without knowing all the, all the details. Let's be thoughtful here. As Carol was mentioning, we have a terrible history of in, out, in, out, up, down, do this, do that. People are relying on our leadership globally, and they're taking our cues from us. We can't be that knee jerk. We have to be quick, I agree with you, speed, mm. but thoughtful and over communicate with the Hill, not just the converted. That's whom I think the administration tends to speak to. Now it's time for a conversation difficult as it may be with those who are, are, are very much against us. I know Secretary Clinton have been doing that. It's, these are tough conversations with Senator Kirk and, mm. and others who are going to be very strong voices on this. But I, that is my sense that it would behoove the administration to not get out ahead on the cuts, but get out ahead on the communi you know, helping people understand what's at stake here and do it thoughtfully. Okay, one last, we're going to, oh, sorry, I'm, I, yeah, I'm just seeing there's okay. a number of no, hands. I'm going to uh, give, give, Mr. So Gaiosa is going to get the last word and because then we need to wrap it up. So Tom, the gentleman in the middle row. Antonio Gaioso. I am a refugee from USAID and the State Department. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with the panel that there is a need for conversation. I, I work in ITCA, remember ITCA? coordination agency, I call it the Talido Might Agency because it had no powers of any kind. But the point is that there's a conversation that is missing and that is with the US public. When you ask a common person in the in Washington even in Washington, what does AID do? Oh they take twenty percent of the GDP of the budget. What does it do? They don't know. There's generic ignorance and none of the administrations in the last 30 years has taken that task to say, we're going to explain to you carefully what is that this is all about and why. It's almost like the healthcare bill. Do you know what the healthcare bill has for you? Probably not. Everyone is fighting, and yet, now what we have is a worst case scenario. We have the coffee party, we have the tea party, we have all of these parties, and they want to kill AID because it's a waste of money in, so in Switzerland. Don't you think that that should be a primary objective before or mm -hmm. while we talk with yeah. each other? Thank you. Let me just, I'll take the pr moderator's prerogative and just respond briefly to that and say thank, I do think that there does require a public education of what foreign assistance does, but I think it has to be tied to a variety of interests that the traditional development community may not want to tie it to. So it's things like national security or uh, business interest or trade or keep, I think, or it's a second, it's sort of a secondary, it's not, it's not the immediate thought when, when we talk amongst ourselves in the development community, I'll put it that way. Um, I do think my other reason for having this conversation is to begin to have an adult conversation about what are we going to do in this budget environment? We can we can wait, we can wait for some, someone else to make the decisions for the development community or we can get ahead of it and have some thoughtful alternatives because this is going to be coming one way or the other and I think, I don't, I think that, uh, so I'll stop there. I want to thank the panel and uh, I hope some of you will stick around and uh, to, to chat uh, uh, with the audience. Thanks very much.